Hey everyone, welcome back for another week. We're going to be talking about the spiritual ascent that ends on Yom Kippur. And we're going to be discussing it live tonight with everybody here and with those of you at home. If you want to follow along, please uh, follow us directly. Watch it live at facebook.com forward slash Pinchas Taylor. Leave your questions there. Give us a like. Give us a share. And that's the, you know, really it's the best and easiest mitzvah that you could possibly do. Because just with that click of the share, you've spread Torah to thousands of people. So just uh, get that get that one extra easy mitzvah before Yom Kippur comes. And uh, we will, uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be good in your favor. Okay, so let's, let's jump right into it. Welcome everybody back to Monday Night's Jewish Essentials, the greatest hour of the work week in the greatest place in South Florida. Yes, yes, that's where we're at. Okay, so we're, we're going to, before we jump into Yom Kippur and the spiritual ascent that we are about to experience beginning tomorrow night, we're going to first give some review and preface of what entering into the new year that we did last week represents, okay? So we said that entering into the month of Tishrei, which is the month in which Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchas Torah all fall, begins with Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And we said that the astrological sign for the month of Tishrei is Libra. Libra, the symbolism of Libra, if you look on your uh, zodiac chart, the symbol of Libra is the scales of justice, right? The weights, just scales of justice. And that is very indicative of the energy that is present the entire month of Tishrei, this entire month, where God is sort of judging each one of us, right? Weighing our merits and weighing our demerits uh, as far as how we should be judged for the upcoming year. How did last year look and how should this year look as a reflection of that? Okay, so the judgment begins on Rosh Hashanah, and it continues on. And if there's anything that is lacking throughout the throughout the year, uh, if there's anything. Excuse me. If there's anything that was lacking or judged not favorably on Rosh Hashanah, we still have through Yom Kippur till the verdict is sealed, right? Till the stamp goes on the paper. Okay, so. It's a time of forgiveness. It's a time of forgiving others. It's a time of forgiving ourselves. It's a time of gaining forgiveness from God. And one of the easy ways that, uh, that a person, by the way, just a little tip, when it comes to forgiving others, one of, the e one, of the, one of the tips that we can have when doing that, if it's hard for us to forgive somebody, is that we can replace our anger, or try to replace our anger with compassion, compassion for that person. In other words, one way to do that, to, to envision the person in a way of compassion as opposed to a way of anger, is that remember that the one who wronged you was, think about them as, as a child, that they had a childhood as well, they were subject to parents and incidents with their own lackings and insecurities. And with that, the person became who they became. So again, not an excuse of why they did what they did, but it might make certain things easier to forgive when you see a person not as just the incident that happened, but you see them try you try to see them as one collective picture. Yeah. So we said that the seventh month. Tishrei is called Yera Ha'esamim, the strong month, the month where God is empowering us to strengthen over any deficiencies that we have. Uh, we said that the number seven is a very significant in the sense that it symbolizes completion. Uh, we also said that the, the Hebrew month that this is called Tishrei, right, it's spelled Tuf, Shin, Resh, and Yud, Tuf being the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Shin, the second to last letter, Reish, the third to last letter, and Yud, representing God's name. It's symbolic that this entire month, even someone who has fallen all the way down, 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 right, all the way down to the tough, to the last letter of the alphabet, can slowly make their way back from the tough to the Shin, from the Shin to the Reish, from the Reish all the way back to God's name. Step by step, we can get back to where we need to be. So God gives us 10 days of repentance to sort of uh, complete, make, make any 
changes that we need to in the final sealing process. So Rosh Hashanah happens, God gives us initial judgment, and then God desires our return so much that he gives us ten full days where the Jewish spark inside of us is inflamed, where we're extra inspired to make changes. And each of the seven days of the week that are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, right, the ten days includes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the seven days in between correspond to that day cosmically for one's entire life. So in other words, the Wednesday between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur corresponds to you can make up for every Wednesday in your life, right? And the same thing with Thursday. Every Wednesday in your life, not only the past year, but every Thursday in your life. So tomorrow, which is Tuesday, you can amend every Tuesday, not only from last year, but you can amend every Tuesday of your life. All right, so it's a very special experience, a very special time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, the ten days, right, are comp also symbolize completion. There's ten commandments that when when God creates the world, uh, it says it, it says uh, it, it, it does it in ten utterances, right? And there's ten days of teshuva. Ten is also a number of of completion in the spiritual realm. So that's, that is sort of the idea that we're trying to ascend to, right? To move from Rosh Hashanah to Tim Kippur in, in a way of spiritual ascent. That's the idea. That's the mindset that we need to have. So why is Yom Kippur, why does it fall the day that it falls? What is it, what historically happened? Why is Yom Kippur the day of forgiveness? Because when Moses went up the mountain the second time, right? When he went up the first time, he comes down, he spends 40 days and 40 nights up there. He comes down, the Jewish people are worshiping the golden calf, and he sees what's going on, and the ta he breaks the tablets. And so after beseeching God for forgiveness, he's called back up to the mountain. He says, you know, Moses, come back up the mountain, and I'm going to give you a second set of tablets. He stays up 40 days and 40 nights. He goes up on the first day of the month of Elul, and he stays up 40 days and 40 nights, comes down on the 10th of Tishrei, which we call Yom Kippur. So the 10th of Tishrei, is, which is Yom Kippur, is the, the conclusion of this 40-day ladder that we've been climbing to gain forgiveness, to attain a certain spiritual connection, a closeness with God that is coming to its pinnacle come tomorrow night, right? And that Yom Kippur is when the final decree is sealed. When it, when whatever was written on Rosh Hashanah, when we say, right, Kasiva, right? And we say Kasiva, you should be written the Chasima and sealed for a good year. So the sealing happens on Yom Kippur the final ceiling. And so Yom Kippur is actually a glimmer of the world to come. The, the reasons that we do what we do on Yom Kippur is because we've achieved somewhat of an angelic status. And so angels don't eat and angels don't drink. Right? These, these are certain things that are done because we are like the angels. We dress in white traditionally as well because that's representing the purity, representing the angels. And so again, Yom Kippur symbolizes the pinnacle of what, of what uh, a human being is able to achieve, that closeness with God. Now, a lot of people, by the way, are under the misconception that any 24 hours uh, is what you have to do to, to follow the fasting. It's a, it's a very certain period, right? You can find it on the calendar near you when sunset begins and then when nightfall begins the, the 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 following day it's not just whatever 24 hours i think if i stop eating if i stop eating dinner last night at five i can break my fast at five it doesn't work like that right the fast starts when it starts and ends when it ends regardless of the last time you ate so look at the calendar you know so the idea of the the great spiritual nature of yom kippur is reflected in one of the, in the, uh, the great spiritual nature of Yom Kippur is reflected in what takes place or what took place on Yom Kippur in the Holy Temple. In the Holy Temple, one of the things that took place was you had the high priest 
going into the Holy of Holies on the day of Yom Kippur. It was the only day on the calendar that anyone would go into the Holy of Holies. Right? The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant uh, remained, which contained the Ten Commandments. It was considered the nucleus of existence, the, the core of all spiritual it's all spiritual realms where, where the heavens and the earth sort of merge and kiss, right? It had no phys it was a physical place that had no physical measure. It's kind of strange for us to, to sort of think of that contradiction, but that was the place, the merge of the physical world and the spiritual worlds. And so it was the holiest place entered into by the holiest man on the holiest day. Before the sin of Adam and Eve, all of creation was equal. All human beings, everyone was the same, equally spiritual, equally holy. All places were the same, equally spiritual, equally holy. All times were the same, equally spiritual, equally holy. When Adam and Eve sinned, what they did cosmically is they brought fragmentation into the world. That time space and people had gradations of holiness right so now you have amongst the nations of the world you have the nations of the world and then you have those who observe the seven laws of noah and then you have the jewish community and within the jewish community you have the the, the priests right the levites and then the israelites and then amongst the priests you have one high priest so there's gradations of people's accessibility to holiness in in space as well Right? All lands were the same, but now Israel is the, right? the land of Israel is the holiest of countries. Jerusalem is the holiest of cities. And then you focus on the Temple Mount, and then the Holy of Holies is the holiest spot. There's gradations. And days, right? Every you know, a regular Wednesday is one level of holiness. It's kind of mundane, actually. But then Shabbos is a certain degree of holiness. And then you have Yom Kippur, which is Shabbos Shabbosan, right? The Sabbath of Sabbaths. So there's gradations in space as well, and in, in, in time as well. And so what, what, so what takes place on Yom Kippur is you have the holiest spot entered into by the holiest person on the holiest day, all three things merging in its, in its pinnacle, in its core, and achieving that which cannot be achieved throughout the rest of the year. And so... Every year on Yom Kippur, we have a certain uh, angelicness to a certain holiness that is revealed that is not available the rest of the year. In fact, one of the things that it says is that Hasatan, right, the Satan, right, the evil inclination, has a numeric value, right? If you take the words, if you take the word Satan or right, Hasatan, right, the devil, and you add it up, the value of the letters, right, hey. Each each one letter by letter, what you would what would it, what it would add up to is the number three sixty four, right? What does that sound like? How many days are there in the year? Three sixty five. Three sixty four means that Hasat and the devil, right, evil inclination, has dominion or has access to a person on all the three hundred and sixty four days of the year, right? But not on Yom Kippur, not one day a year where that. He knows his limits. He knows that he doesn't have the same access to a person as he might uh, throughout the course of the year. So teshuva, the idea of returning to our pure state, which is achieved on Yom Kippur, is something that we're all sort of shooting for, right? That is the idea. Many people uh, sort of think of the idea of teshuva, sometimes the way that the word teshuva is translated is repentance, right? The day of repentance. But really, it's a day of return. Because ultimately, deep down, every person is pure, is good, is holy. And so it's just a matter of returning to that prior state of existence. You don't have to become something new. You have to become what you really are. So you don't have to chase something that doesn't exist, right, or exists outside of you, or, return, or, or uh, repent, and, and the idea of getting, it's the idea of returning to the self, of who you really are inside. And one of the questions I ask a lot of people is, do you really know who you even are inside? Do you know what 
a soul is. And one of the things, one of the exercises that we can kind of think about that just on a very superficial way to think about the soul is if you envision yourself looking back at yourself in the mirror. But instead of seeing your current self, imagine your 15-year-old self is looking back at you. So it's not you looking back, it's your 15-year-old self. And your 15-year-old self probably looks very different than, he does, than you do today. 15-year-old self had braces. 15-year-old self had pimples. 15-year-old self looked very different. It had a different hairstyle. Everything was different. If you backtrack another five years and have your 10-year-old self looking back at you, you look very different as well from your 15-year-old self even. Your 10-year-old your self maybe had crooked teeth, maybe had freckles. It was a different, it was a different you. It's a different looking you. Your five-year-old self also looked different. So throughout the course of your life, physically, you're constantly changing. Which one of those is the real you? Which one of those is the real me? Emotionally inside, we're also changing. What made me happy and sad and excited when I was 15 was different than when I was five different than it is now. It might be different 20 years from now as well. Which one of those is the real me? Right? Intellectually, we think about things differently now than we did when we were 5 and 15. And we'll think about things differently 10 years or 20 years from now as well. Question is, if we're constantly changing, if physically we're constantly changing, and emotionally we're constantly changing, and intellectually we're constantly changing, which one of those is the real me. My five-year-old self, my 20-year-old self, my 50-year-old, which one is me? How do I even know when I'm looking at myself in the mirror that it's me looking back at me? And so the answer, what we call that place of permanence within us, that us that lives inside of us, we call that place the soul, right? The us that lives inside of us us, that unchanging, godly, divine place within us, that's a soul, the part that doesn't change. Now the soul wants to connect very much to God. Soul is spiritual. It only desires the spiritual. It wants to connect to God. It wants to connect to others. But the body, and the ego, and the emotions, which are supposed to be conduits to expressing the soul, oftentimes, instead of being a conduit to express the soul, become zeroed in on the physical. The body, right, start, instead of being something that reflects the soul, something that expresses the soul, becomes something that has its own desires. It has its own cravings. So the problem is that most of the time, we zero in on the physical. Our body zeroes in on the physical. And instead of being a vessel, right, it becomes a shell that conceals, that obscures the godliness inside. Instead of being a, like the, like the outside of uh, the, 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 the glass part of, the, of a light bulb that is meant to sort of express and, and, and shine out the light of the light bulb, it becomes something that conceals it, that hides it. So this divine, godly spark that we have inside becomes concealed. We conceal it with going after the physical world. And within ourselves, sometimes this shell that we create, this, this, this obscuring of our godly self, becomes so many there become so many layers obscuring this divine spark within us. So we, hit, we hinder the connection that we have with God sometimes. That spiritual pipeline that we have, God is always ready to connect with us, but sometimes through the muck that we've put ourselves in, through getting into bad habits, doing things that we're not supposed to do, doing things that we know we shouldn't do, we create a thick layer sometimes of clouds that obscure our, our divine connection. Teshuva, returning to the self is getting back to that core within us. And one way to think about teshuva, kind of an interesting way, I, I like to think of teshuva as spiritual time travel. 
Teshuva is very much the idea of spiritual time travel. In fact, it says in, in the Talmud that Teshuva is great in the sense that it can transform sins into merits. It can make, it could, if a person returns properly and sincerely, the sins that a person has done can become meritorious. They can be things that propel you to do the right thing. Forgiveness from teshuva, right? A person does teshuva, or a person returns, a person makes up, repents. In the present, they can correct the past and change their future. One of the interesting things, you know, you know the movie Back to the Future, right? Everyone knows the movie Back to the Future. So it's kind of, think about it like Back to the Future. So in the first one, right, Marty goes back in time to the 1950s, and he does something that changes his past. Right? He stops his parents from meeting. And then the result of that, after he accidentally stops his parents from meeting, well, then, it be, then it, he starts, what he's doing back then is he's changing what's going on in the present. Right? He starts disappearing because if they never meet, then he's never born, and what's going to happen? And the same thing in Back to the Future Part 2, where they go, he goes back, where Biff goes back and gives himself, right? If he goes, he was in the year 2015, and he goes back to the 1950s, gives himself an almanac with all the sports scores. And then when Marty and Doc go back to 1985, they find a very different 1985 than the one that they left. Because a change in the past, right, can reshape the future. So what happens when a person does teshuva in the present, right, you say, God, I'm sorry about what I did. And you mean it sincerely. And I want to get connected. And I want to reestablish re myself and I want to get things back the way that they should be what happens is inside right those past deeds that you did right now you've confessed and you've, you've made amends and Hashem forgives you it's as if those past events didn't exist and if those past events didn't exist the ripple effect that comes about from them also changes because, again, when a person does a certain thing wrong or a certain does anything, right, there's a ripple effect. There's actions that come about. But when you go back in time and those, those events never happened, well, the ripple effect that those things created never exists. You've created an alternate timeline, right, just like in Back to the Future Part 2. You're living in a different 1985 now because you've eradicated those sins in the past. Excuse me. And now your present and your future is completely different because of what you've done right now. And so the idea of Yom Kippur is that opportunity where we have to really zero in on Teshuvah, on making ourselves better in the present, nullifying certain things that we did in the past and thereby changing our future. So it's very important to zero in on what the meaning of Yom Kippur is and how Teshuva relates to time travel. In fact, the reason that we're able to do that is because when we connect with God, we transcend time. God's name, Yud with a He and a Vav and a He, which is how it's spelled in Hebrew, is actually an acronym or, or a, a combination of the words He was, is and always will be all existing simultaneously the one who is was and always will be the one who's not confined by time the one who's above time and so if we're connecting with god then we become above time as well and in which case anything that we did in the past becomes absolved and it's we instantly enter into a new dimension where we are living in a different timeline than when we were previously but we got to do real teshuva for that. We have to really return. It's not just a matter of, you know, going to the synagogue and, uh, you know, uh, reading some prayers and then boom, boom, I'm absolved. We've got to really put effort in. We have to really try, evaluate ourselves, think how I'm going to be different, how I'm going to change, how I can get back to the real me inside, that innocent place that desperately wants to do the right thing. So we got to get on the right path. And one of the things that happens is that, you know, there's a, there's a common thread 
amongst all the sins that we do. Whenever we do something that we shouldn't do, our, we, our, our lens gets clouded, right? In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah, your sins separate you from the Lord your God. Right? It's, it's, it's not that God is separating himself from us. It's we separate ourselves. We cloud the vision. We put the clouds on. We, get, we put ourselves in the darkness. Nothing has changed from God's end, but on our end, we put the clouds. We put the darkness. So the first thing that we need to do in order to atone and repent properly is we have to admit we have to make amends with ourselves. We have to admit fault. Right? We have to admit that we made a mistake. Don't try to pass blame. Don't try to put, put it on your parents, your surroundings. You've got to own up to what we did wrong. That's the very first step. You know, Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, they, they didn't do that. Right? Adam and Eve, Adam sins. He eats from fruit that Eve gives him. And then when Adam, when, when, when Hashem comes along, God says to him, Adam, like, what's going on? I told you not to eat from the, I told you not to eat from the, the tree of, the tree of life, the tree of, uh, of good and evil. And instead of saying, I'm sorry for what I did, he says, you know that woman you gave me? She's the one who gave it to me. I, I, I was just this innocent bystander. She, she's the one who gave it. You got to own up to what you did. That's the first step. The first step in making amends with yourself, with others, and with God is owning up to it. Now, amends with God it takes three steps. Right? We call them the three R's. Recognition of our past shortcomings. Right? Recognizing where we erred. Reversal of one's conduct. Right? Not doing that anymore. And resolution to change for the future. So identify, right? Re recognition, right? You identify what you did wrong. Resolution, uh, excuse me, a reversal of, of your actions, right? I'm not going to do what I've been doing. And, and then a resolution never to do it again as well. And, and sin, sin has two aspects to it. There's the deed that we do, and then there's the pleasure that we have from it. There's the actual sin that a person commits, and then there's the pleasure. No one, no one does a sin unless they're gaining a certain pleasure from it, Right? So there's two elements of every sin. It's like the body of the sin and the soul of the sin. The body of the sin is the actual sin, the action that is done. The soul of the sin is the, feel, the good feeling that you get or the momentary feeling of pleasure that you get from doing that. And that's the soul of the sin. And so in order to make amends on the sin, you have to also combat it body and soul. Body and soul means that the body is you confess what you did. You say, I'm sorry about the, what I've actually done. And to counteract the soul is a feeling of remorse. To, count, to counteract the pleasureful feeling that you had from momentarily sinning, you have to have that feeling of remorse, that emotional uh, regret inside, the feeling of regret inside to really counteract uh, that as well. So confession is gets rid of the action because, because confession is an action and the remorse gets rid of the soul, the feeling, the good feeling that you had. Now, all of this begins uh, at Kol Nidre, tomorrow night. All of it begins tomorrow night. And one of the things that's interesting about Kol Nidre is that if you look at the wording itself, if you read the words in English, it's very strange. It's very, it's written very much like an Aramaic legal document. The way that Kol Nidre started, Kol Nidre means all vows. And during the, in particular in the times of the Spanish Inquisition where the Jews were forced at point of sword to say that they were going to leave Judaism, they were going to leave the faith, and so they were forced to say those words with their mouth. They would come Yom Kippur and say all those words that I said when I was saying with my mouth that I'm going to leave my faith, I didn't mean any of those things. right? And they would say all my vows are null and void. Now, thank God today we don't have that same uh, oppression. We don't have that same... 
But so what's the significance of Kol Nidre today, annulling all of our vows, all of, the, all of our words that we spoke that were not true? I'll tell you like this. There's an interesting story. And the story is with a Hasid, right, a Hasidic rabbi named Peretz Chaim. And he was sitting with a group of Hasidim having a fabreng and having a get-together in the basement of a home before there was electric lighting. And so he and, his, he and the Hasidim, he and his friends, were sitting in this basement, candles lit everywhere, and they were enjoying each other's company, and they were singing, and they were saying l'chaim, and they were being inspired by words of Torah. And with the great revelry and camaraderie that came with that, they really got into it. They were really binding and, and uplifting themselves. And what happened was a gust of wind came and knocked out most of the candles, blew out most of the candles. So there was just one small candle that was flickering in that basement. But the Hasidim were so enthralled with what they were doing that they didn't stop the party. They didn't stop the revelry. They didn't start the, stop the singing. And they continued and continued as if nothing had happened. Nothing changed. So there was a Hasid. There was, a, there was an individual who was walking by. And he heard the great camaraderie and the great singing that was happening in this home. And he says, I'd like to go join. And he knocks on the door. And he opens it up, and they say, come down into the basement. Right? Come join us. And he's walking down the stairs very slowly because he can't see anything. And the group of Hasidim that's down in the basement already say, where is this guy? He knocked 10 minutes ago. Where is he? And they yelled up for him, hey, where are you? And so he yelled back down. He says, I can't see anything. Right? There's too much darkness. I can't see where I'm going. And so one of the Hasidim from down in the basement said, well, he said, give yourself a few minutes, right? Give yourself a few minutes. Your eyes will get used to the darkness, and it won't bother you anymore, and you can come join us. And Reb Peretz Chaim looked at his friends in the basement. He says, isn't that our problem in life, that we let the darkness not bother us? We're sitting in darkness and you could get so used to the darkness that it doesn't bother you anymore. When we talk about darkness, we talk about darkness within. There are dark places within us. There are clouds that have sort of been put over us. And when we, when we look around and we see the cloudiness, we see the darkness, at first it might be something that bothers us, but after a while we kind of get used to it. No, just accept this is where I am, this place of darkness. And we don't even realize that it's darkness anymore. And this darkness that happens on the inside reflects the way that we look at the world. Because whatever happens on the inside to a person, whatever what's going on inside of a person is the way in which we project to the outside. So if a person's feeling darkness on the inside, Guess how a person is going to see the world on the outside? It's a place of darkness. When we get so used to the darkness, we don't even, it doesn't even bother us anymore. We're sitting in darkness. We don't even realize that it's dark. I told this story to a few people a few weeks ago about these two kids who wanted to play a joke on their grandfather. Their grandfather had fallen asleep on the couch. And in order to wake him up, they went to the refrigerator and got some of the cheese that was spoiling. Some of the cheese that was spoiling, they took the container of, with the cheese and they went over to their grandfather on the couch. They were going to play a little joke and they put it up to his nose that he should smell the cheese and, and, and wake up from it. But when they, got, when they put it up to his nose, they got a little too close to his nose and a little bit of the cheese, the rotting cheese, went into his nostrils. And when that happened, he started waking up, and the two kids saw what was going on, and they ran away. And the grandfather looks around, he smells what's going on in the living room, he says, ugh, it stinks in here. And then he goes into the bedroom, he inhales, he smells the same cheese that's stuck in his nose, ugh, it stinks in here also. 
And he goes into the kitchen, he smells in the kitchen. Oh, it stinks in the kitchen as well. And finally, he goes outside and he smells and still smells bad. And he says, the whole world stinks. And this is what happens when we let the darkness, when we let the stinkiness that's inside of us stay with us. We don't even realize that it's dark inside of us. Stop bothering us, the darkness. The stinkiness has settled in us. And then when we look around at the world, we see the world as a dark and stinky place. And when we look at the world as a dark and stinky place, we start telling ourselves things that are spiritually limiting. What do we start telling ourselves? We say, I'm never going to find happiness. That marriage that didn't work out, that was my only chance. I'll never find love. That business deal that I was going to land that didn't work out, I'm never going to make it. That addiction that I have, I'm never going to shake it. And we start thinking and telling ourselves messages that are dark and stinky. And they're, all, they're, in a way, a spiritual vow that we promise ourselves. I promise myself I can never find love. I can never break that addiction. I can never tame this depression. I can never do any of that. And these are the messages that we tell ourselves. These are the vows. These are the promises. These are the spiritually limiting messages that we tell ourselves over and over again. And what happens on Yom Kippur, beginning Kol Nidre, right? What is Kol Nidre about? Annulling all of our vows. All the words that I've spoken that are not true, it's time to annul them. Not only the ones that I've said in the past, but if I'm going to say one this year, I am making a firm decree that they are all null and void. They have no meaning. They don't carry anything with me. I am not limited by the baggage, by the spiritually limiting weights and constraints and shackles that I put on myself. And so all of that begins tomorrow night with Kol Nidre. We begin Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre because it's the time where we, we tell ourselves, I am not going to be limited by the words, by the vows that I've set on myself. I'm not going to be spiritually limited by these spiritually, this spiritually limiting mentality that I keep telling myself. Why do I keep doing that? Why do I keep saying that? I'm here by declaring all of those words null and void. I can break that addiction. I can find love. I can break this depression. I can shake that anxiety. I can do all of that. And the breaking of the shackles begins when we declare with full force all of these spiritually limiting vows that I've put on myself, all of these words that I've contained and locked myself in are null and void. They don't exist. God is lifting us out of the darkness. And that's what happens on Yom Kippur. You ever notice when you fly, it could be a really cloudy day. Like today was a very, it was an awfully cloudy day, rainy and disgusting. You ever, you ever take off in an airplane when it's a cloudy day, but then once you get above the clouds, it's like a whole different world. The sun is shining. You look down, it's only white puffy clouds that you see. It looks like heaven. Or down below, it's, it's still dark and it's still rainy and it's still gross, but once you've been lifted up, the light is shining in all its glory. Once you've been lifted up, it looks like heaven. Right? When we imagine heaven, that's what, basically, when we look out the, the, the window of an airplane, that's, for us, that's heaven. That's what, that's what we picture heaven looking like, right? 
bright and sunny and clouds. And that's, that's how we think of it. And so, again, the reality is that down on, down on the ground, it's still rainy, it's still, but the sun is still shining. No matter what, the sun is still shining. And when God lifts us up on the day of Yom Kippur, he tells us you don't have to be limited by your darkness. You don't have to let the darkness, the clouds, the stinky parts of life, you don't have to let that confine you. You don't have to let that limit you. You don't have to let that be who you are because it's not who you are. These are clouds. But clouds are not a real existence. They're covering up on the sun that is still shining. These sins that we've done in, the, in our past, this life, these, these things that we've told ourselves, they're just clouds. The soul inside us is still shining. It's still powerfully illuminating. And if we want it, we can access it and we can make our life into a place where the clouds go away and the sun contain, remains shining throughout our, throughout our day and throughout our life. We got to want it and we got to do it. And the opportunity to do so comes on Yom Kippur. So with that, we will, we will uh, end with blessings that everyone, everyone should be sealed for good, for a good and happy uh, year with blessings physically, with blessings spiritually, psychologically, intellectually, every area of life sealed for ultimate goodness. And uh, we should see you after the holidays because, again, the next two weeks is going to be holidays on Mondays and Tuesdays, right, with Sukkot and Simchas Torah the following week. Right after that, we should see all of you back for a, another exciting lesson. Uh, and I, I look forward to learning with all of you uh, together at home as well. And God willing, we'll see all of you soon. Have a great night. Be sealed for good. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. How did Noah protect himself from the tumultuous flood? By coming into the ark. In Hebrew, the word teva means both ark and word. And by you and I delving into the words of Torah, we too are saved and protected from the tumultuous and catastrophic events that happen throughout our lives. The ARC online learning program is your opportunity, no matter what your religious background is, to delve into Torah in a thorough and clear way with a rabbi. Now, you don't have a lot of time. You're dealing with work. You're dealing with the kids. You're dealing with all sorts of stuff. That's why we've condensed every day's lesson into 15 minutes. Plus, you'll have access to all the back archives and access to the rabbi. So anytime you can learn at your own pace and whatever time you choose. I hope that you'll sign up for the ARC today. If you have any questions about it, just comment below. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all of you on board the ARC today.